Hello, and welcome to Game Gems. Today, we're going to take a quick look at an old school programming technique that definitely belongs in your toolbox bit flags. Bit flags are a handy way to cram a lot of data into a very small amount of memory. This is useful for all sorts of things, from optimizing network performance and save game file sizes to simplifying data entry and managing things like quest systems. Bit flag operations are also faster than their equivalent arithmetic operations, allowing you to squeeze that much more performance out of your game. But first, we need to talk about binary numbers, how they're stored in memory, and the logical operators we can use to manipulate them as a result. If you weren't aware, computers count in binary. This means that they only understand the numbers 0 and 1. Everything in your game, code, assets, audio, data, is internally represented as really, really long strings of these zeros and ones, which are also called bits. You may have already heard this term in game development before because it's fairly common to refer to things by their bit values. For example, the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis were marketed as 16-bit consoles because their chip registers could store data in blocks of 16 bits at a time. And yes, I know it's actually more complicated than that. Stay with me here. Each data type is allocated a particular number of bits in order to store its value. The simplest one, the Boolean, is represented by either a 0, also known as false, or a 1, which is true. However, you can't allocate a single bit for a variable, so depending on the programming language, Booleans are usually stored in either 8 or 16 bits. As you can imagine, this is pretty wasteful. It bloats the storage requirement by up to 16 times what is actually needed. On the other hand, an integer in Godot is a 64-bit number, which means it gets a full 64 zeros and ones to play with. That's the equivalent of 64 Boolean variables, packed as closely together as the computer will allow. We can then manipulate each of these individual bits, or the variable as a whole, to manage our Booleans as if they were, in fact, individual variables. We'll see how that works in a moment. Before we do, let's look at what the binary values actually represent, so we know what we're manipulating. As previously mentioned, computers represent numbers in binary. Without going into the whys and hows of it, each bit position in the variable is equal to the binary equivalent of 2 to the power of that position. For example, a 1 in the rightmost position is 1 in binary, which is 2 to the power of 0. A 1 in the second rightmost position is equal to 2 to the power of 1, which is 2. This continues all the way up to the leftmost position, which is 2 to the power of 63. You might think that you can just use the POW function to calculate one of these values, i.e., and you'd be right. However, there's a faster way, the left shift operator. The left shift operator takes the bits of a particular variable and shifts them to the left by the indicated value. If we shift the value 1 to the left by however many positions are equivalent to the exponent, we've done the exact same thing. But you may be asking, why is this faster? Well, it's faster because manipulating the bits of a variable directly is always faster than using arithmetic or calling a function. The reason for this is that all high-level code is converted into low-level instructions that the computer can understand, and bitwise operations like the left shift operator take less of these low-level instructions to carry out. Less instructions equals faster code. Now, this is the clever bit, pun intended. Once you're able to indicate which bit position you want to manipulate, Flipping it on and off is equivalent to setting that imaginary Boolean value to true or false. The trick is to only flip the bit you want without changing any of the other bits. We do that with a group of operators called, appropriately enough, bitwise operators. And fortunately, we only need two or three of them to do the job. First, let's look at how to set a bit, also, as you've probably guessed, known as a flag, within a variable. Here's a variable that we'll be using to store our flags. As you can see, it's currently set to some integer value other than zero, which means we've already set a bunch of flags within it. We want to flip the fourth bit of the value and preserve the rest. We do this with the OR operator. The OR operator performs a logical OR operation on each bit position in the input values, flipping the equivalent bit in the output value to 1 if either of the input bits are 1, or 0 if neither of them are. So all we have to do is provide an input value with the correct bit position set in order to flip the bit in the flags variable. And, as we've already seen, we can get a value with the correct bit position flipped by using the left shift operator. Here's the line of code that bundles all of this together. Take your flag variable, or it with the proper input, then store the results back in the flag variable. Now that we can set a flag, how do we clear it? Why, with your operator's weird younger brother, the exclusive or. This operator outputs a 1 if, and only if, both input values are different. That means if both values are either 0 or 1, the resulting value will be 0. Otherwise, they'll be 1 which preserves the original values of each bit position in our flags variable nicely. Here's the code. It's almost exactly the same as for setting a flag, except the operator is different. Finally, how can we check if a particular bit has been set? 
We can do that with the AND operator. The AND operator, as you may have guessed, outputs a 1 if both input values are 1 and a 0 otherwise. We thus AND the flag with our flag's variable and check if the result is equal to 0. If it's not, then our flag was set. Well, that was certainly a bunch of $5 words in math, wasn't it? How can we use this in Godot? One of the most common uses of bit flags within Godot is when exporting variables. Unfortunately, not all of the functionality that makes flags super useful has made it to Godot 4.0, so if you want to take full advantage of this feature, you might want to stick with 3.x. I'll show you how flags work in 4.0 first, and then backtrack to cover the additional features. If you want to define a variable as a set of flags, you can use the export flags annotation. At the bare minimum, you'll need to provide a list of names for the flags. Here's an example you might be familiar with from your attempts to catch them all. The underlying variable is an integer. Selecting any of the provided options, one or many, internally sets their bit positions to the correct values as though we'd done it ourselves using the sample code above. Once we have this value available to us, we can set, reset, or check if any of the flags have been set in a few different ways. The easiest way is to define an enum with the same elements as your flags. Enums are internally stored as, unless you redefine them, ascending integers starting at zero, which, by no coincidence, is the exact same mapping as the bit positions provided by the flags. All we need to do to access the value of the corresponding flag is to invoke our code from before, performing a left shift equal to the value of the enum. At this point, you may be saying to yourself, well, that's kind of annoying. I basically need to define the flag's names twice, and if I change the order or add a new flag definition in the middle of the list, it screws everything up. Can I just feed the enum definition into the export type? Funny you should ask, because that is the exact functionality that was left behind in 3.x. Let's take a look. In 3.x, you can simply define your export variable's type to be equal to your enum, and Godot will do the rest. No need for a separate list of strings. It all just works. Unfortunately, the changes made to the internal handling of enums in Godot 4.0 meant that supporting this feature required more work than the team was willing to devote to it at the time. Here's hoping someone will pay it forward in the future. And that's it. If you found this tutorial useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more game gems. And if you'd like to go the extra mile, buy me a coffee. The link is in the description below, as is the Godot documentation for exporting flags. The more caffeine I consume, the more energy I'll have to make content for you to consume. See you next time.